Well, good evening, and welcome to CAF Warbird 2, a show where we talk about warbirds, history, World War II flying, and much more. This uh, show is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. This nonprofit membership organization has preserved and flown historic aircraft for more than 65 years. CAF's mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. And you can support the organization through your donations, by membership, and by volunteering your time and talents. If you'd like to find out more, visit commemorativeairforce.org for more information. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we welcome everybody watching tonight on Facebook, on YouTube, and those of you watching on GoToMeeting. If you would, please take a second and just uh, hit that like, share, or subscribe, or follow us button, depending on which uh, platform you're on, and uh, we'd really appreciate it. On this episode, we're going to explore the amazing career of Colonel Ralph Parr, who flew in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and was a double ace. Now, if you have any questions for our guests, just put them in the chat box, and we'll do our best to address them. And joining us now from Houston, Texas, is uh, author Ken Murray. Good evening, Ken. Welcome to the show. Steve, thanks for having me. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Well, uh, before we get into the book, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, you and your career, which is um, also uh, an amazing uh, Air Force career, 25 years uh, in the service. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, got to be uh, where you are today. You bet. I, uh, I was born and raised in Iowa. and. Uh, Went through, went to Northern Iowa, and after graduation, moved to Austin, Texas, and worked for a year in, in uh, selling graphic arts. And uh, I saw the RF force flying over from Bergstrom every day. And so one day at lunch, I saw him fly over, and I was like, I wonder what it takes to do that. And uh, ended up, I, I had there happened to be a recruiting office right on the way, so I stopped in there and went back to work from lunch and uh, just chatted with them. They said, Yeah, you can take the FOQT. Long story short, took the AFOQT, did fine on that, and uh, came, in, came in in uh, 86 and went to NAB school out at Mather in 86. Um, got tankers out of there, KC-135s out of NAB school, um, and started my career off. Uh, I've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff, and started my career off going to uh, Fairchild for uh, survival school, and I'm standing out there with all of our guys in our flights and we're practicing the pyro techniques the, the, the gyro jet pyro techniques out in the field and the thunderhawks are practicing their takeoff the kc-135 and b-52 sax flight demonstration team and the tanker went down right in front of us it was like oh my god i'm going to that bird i mean i'm headed for castle for training right after this so uh the initial start was holy cow you know what am i getting myself into but um that was a rough day, uh, rough times, but I went there, I went to Castle, came through there, and then my first assignment was at, uh, in Rapid City at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, went there from uh, 80, 86, 87 until 92. Um, did uh, Operation Just Cause there when we went down and got Noriega, and then uh, Desert Storm as well out of, out of there. Went over to Riyadh for, for Desert Storm. Um, in the meantime, after Desert Storm, then another uh, Cats Have Nine Lives type thing. I was involved in a midair with a B-1 uh, uh, in, on a SAC bomb, bomb count practice mission. And that was March 24th of 92, so 30 years ago, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, everyone came out of that all right. Uh, we were grounded for four months and that sort of thing, but saw that. Did, had that happen to me. Um, came out of there and went down and set up a nav school during, in, right after uh, uh, Big George Bush had, had shut down the, uh, the alerts and with the drawdowns, they moved the nav school from Mather down to Randolph in San Antonio. So I went down and was one of the eight initial cadre to help set up the nav school there uh, in the 92, 93 timeframe. And that went to, uh, then I went to Torch Magazine, went to the headquarters, did a, a, a tour at Torch Magazine for a couple of years, where as the editor, was able to fly F-15s, Tyndall, T-38s, uh, uh, F-16s. It was a lot of fun, just shooting, you know, aerial photography, shooting. And, and through all, throughout my entire career, I've, I've shot, and everywhere we landed, I carry my gear with me and that sort of thing. And uh, so I have a, 
a whole host of, uh, of imagery <laughs> saved up, that's for sure. But then uh, came out of there. Um, after that, we went to uh, McConnell for four years, and then LUD went over there for a, or back to the back to the headquarters for an, for a true headquarters tour, and then uh, LUD over in Qatar for a year during uh, Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. Uh, one thing that I forgot was when I was at, also at Ellsworth in '88. I was over at Ramstein and I saw the French Tricolori crash right in front of us when the Italian demonstration team went down. So I received an Airman's Medal for that, for life-saving efforts. I ran in and I, I had some EM, EMS training uh, in college and that sort of thing. So just tried to help do the best we could, but that was a rough day as well. So seen a lot of stuff um, uh, throughout my career. I ended up, um, end of my career, I set up the, uh, what, to the NAV school out of that headquarters tour. And then the last couple of years set up the new, uh, the 558th flying training squadron at Randolph, which was the new drone squadron for training drone pilots and uh, drone uh, sensor operators. I didn't actually do any training. I was more in, we're, we're getting buildings ready. We're getting all the infrastructure ready to, to uh, make that happen. And it, it did, it, it's going very, very well. So then retired in uh, May of 11, and retired and moved over here to Houston. Uh, actually retired the day after we got Bin Laden. So my goal was always to get him before I retired and it happened, I had nothing to do with it, but it happened. And so that was a feather in my hat, so. Quite a career Quite a and uh, we're going to see some of the, uh, the, some of the photos that uh, you've taken throughout the years. Uh, sure. at the, uh, as soon as we're, uh, well, before we wrap up, uh, but right now I'd just like to talk about the, uh, the book. Uh, yep. I, which is on par and how, first of all, what was the impetus for um, writing the book? What was the inspiration? In my, in my four assignments at Randolph, Ralph, uh, Ralph Parr was, they named it the O Club after him. The, uh, so it's now the Parr O Club and the basement bar is the Auger Inn. So on Fridays, the, the T-38 guys, the, the, in those days, the, uh, the T-37 guys, and follow, after that, T6 guys. And then the NAV school guys and the NAV students, everyone would go to the Auger Inn and he would be down there every Friday. So I knew him very, very well from about the 06 time frame, 05, 06 time frame until, the, until he passed uh, December 7th of 12, 2012. So anyway, um, from, for about five years, I'd go, to, go down there and every Friday and always stop by his table and just, you know, BS with him, have a beer with him. And uh, he would tell me stories. He'd tell everyone stories, you know, anyone who joined us. The young second lieutenants would come in. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time. Um, the young students would come in there and they were just enamored. They were in awe with the stories this guy would tell, as was I. He had me hooked from the first night I talked to him. But he uh, he would relay his stories and, and some of the things that he would say, I would just go, He'd have me, and I'm leaning in, getting closer and closer to him. And, and then, what did you do? And then, what were you thinking? And and then, what what were you anticipating his next maneuver? And then, what did he do? And that sort of thing. And you know, he he had his he had his entire mind. He was he was good to go there, and he'd just go through them, and it was like, oh my god. So in the end, uh, I retired, and I was getting ready to retire. It was late ten, early eleven. And we were at the club and he, he was there and he went home at like eight. And uh, we were wrapping things up. Just a few, a few of the guys were still standing around, you know, BS and, and uh, uh, Ed Pickerel, Pick, and uh, Wayne Mudge, Smudge. Smudge was a F-15E driver and a F-117 guy. And Pick was an F-4 guy, F-16 guy. Retired 06s, we were standing there at the table, standing up, you know, and I said, man, someone's got to tell Ralph's story. I said, I've been listening to this for like five years, and I am in awe. And they kind of looked at each other, and we'd had a couple. And they looked at each other, and they looked back at me, and I said, well, you're getting ready to retire. You've got the time and the money. Why don't you do it? And I was like, holy cow. Okay, that's a major league project. Let me think about it. So that was Friday night. Um, 
came I came back over to Houston. I was gone. I was out of Randolph by that time. I came back over to Houston and discussed it with my wife over the weekend. And she was like, you know what? If if it's something that you want to do, I know you're going to do it in full afterburner. You know, go for it if if that's what you want to do. So I waited until Tuesday and I called. He was in assisted living in New Braunfels, Texas, north of San, between San Antonio and Austin. So I called him in his assisted living home on Tuesday morning at about 9 a.m. I said, Ralph, hey, it's Ken Murray. How are you? And he says, I'm doing fine. How are you? And I said, I'm good. I said, hey, me and Penn Smudge were talking Friday night after you left the club and kind of thought about, you know, it's maybe it's time to tell your story. You know, so you've got so much in that needs to be told. And he's he sat there and he said, he goes, uh, he says, well, you mean we're going to sit around and we're going to talk about flying and airplanes and and that sort of thing? And I said, yeah. And you're, he said, and you're going to tape record it? And I said, exactly. That's exactly what I'm going to do. He goes, I'm in. I said, all right. So I ended up, I drove over there 19 times from Houston. And uh, I'd go over on like a Wednesday or a Thursday, meet with him from like 10 until 12 or 1 for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, then go to the club with him on Friday night and then head back Saturday morning. So I'd get three days of interviews for each trip. And basically he was retelling some of the stuff that he'd told me in the past. He was bringing up new, new you know, instances and that sort of thing. Some of the things I couldn't put in the book, um, but just I just sat there and I, I'd come back, regurgitate everything. So I wore out a Dell keyboard on that book. I started... <laughs> I started hitting the Y and I get an X and that sort of thing. So it was like, yeah. So I, um, but I, I found it out, come back, I'd type up about oh, three pages of questions for the next trip and call him up and say, hey, are you up for a, or for a visit this coming week? You bet, come on over and we'd, we'd do it again. So um, that, that was kind of the emphasis of the book. Um, he ended up, I, I had the book done um before he passed and and by that time he he had he had lung cancer mm -hmm. and so uh he was slowing down quite a bit and he would fall and that sort of thing so um i took the book over just in a three ring binder and i sat over the course of about three days and i read the whole book to him he just sat in his recliner and i sat there and i said ralph I don't expect you to sit there and, and run through this at night or something. I said, I'm just going to read it to you. And he goes, that's fine. So I read through it and uh, got to the final page, turned the page, and uh, he looked up, got a big smile on his face, and just started nodding. So it kind of gained his approval. And uh, then, then the painstaking work of trying to get an agent and get a right. publisher and that sort of thing, that, that's when the author's work really starts. Anyone out there who's thinking about writing a book, Go ahead and shoot me an email. I'll fill you in. <laughs> that's but good. That's, the, that's, uh, that's the emphasis of the book, Steve. All right. Well, let's let's uh, kind of hit some of the highlights of of Ralph's career. Um, yep. His uh, his father was actually a, a naval aviator, which uh, kind of gave gave him the inspiration to uh, think about flying. It did, and he uh, his father uh, Ralph would admit wasn't the best pilot in the world. He ended up. Uh, he took Ralph up. There's a there's a couple of snippets in the book where his first Ralph's first ride was on his dad's lap at five years for his fifth birthday type thing, you know. And his dad ended up he he crashed a couple of seaplanes, uh, naval seaplanes. Uh, never wasn't killed or anything, but um, Ralph would have admitted that um, he wasn't the best. But uh, yeah, his dad was a naval naval aviator. He loved his mom and his dad very much. He he came from. He was a well-grounded guy, which is how you get to where he got in a 34-year career. He was a good dude. Well, you, you mentioned that uh, his his dad wasn't maybe wasn't the best uh, of pilots, but he there's a passage in the book where he gives Ralph, I think, some some sage words of advice that he used throughout his career, probably to uh, to great advantage and words that we all should live by. A amen. You are exactly right. And and. Uh, Ralph was always, uh, even throughout all of his training, I mean, he trained in, you know, I can't even list you the, off the top of my head, the trainers that he went through every time, 
you know how we have pet instructors now they you go you're you're a fake your first first assignment ip that sort of thing they always wanted him to stay because he was so good and uh he didn't want all he wanted to do was go fly and fight you know so he tried to keep on you know stiff arming those those uh ip assignments uh as he progressed and it ended up he ended up you know doing very well and 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 accelerating and, and uh he flew every airplane as well as, as it could be flown, really. Yeah. And uh, he really, like you say, wanted to get into combat, uh, but it was a little bit of a securitist route to get there. It was. It was. He, uh, he ended up, um, these two photos here, that one, I think, was the, the upper left there is when the day he got his wings, I think. I believe so, yes. Uh, and I think that's at Randolph. Okay. Um, the next one down in the lower right, I can't remember where that one was taken uh, off the top of my head. It, it's in a training aircraft, though, um, in one of his training assignments. Yeah, it looks a little bit like a P-38. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where, where it was. I can't remember. But he was, uh, before he, he got assigned to combat in the P-38, he was uh, an instructor for a while. Uh, they, yes. they kept his, his instructors kept trying to keep him in the States, even though he really wanted to get overseas. Exactly. And so the, the P-38 was, was actually his first combat aircraft when he went over to, uh, he, he flew that in the Far East and actually flew over Nagasaki and Hiroshima after the bombs were dropped. He didn't, he didn't really see combat there. Uh, he got there at the end, and so when I when I uh, kind of pinned him on what his likes and dislikes of the P-38, he said that thing would turn, I'm just going to quote what he said, he said that P-38 would turn inside its own ass. He said there was a way that you roll it 90 degrees and just start pulling, you, if you drop the flaps, it would pull through a turn so much faster. And he, that, that just floored him the way that that thing worked, uh, but he really he really liked the P thirty. He didn't he didn't stay in it very long. He wasn't in it very long. And also had an encounter with uh, another famous aviator who uh, also has ties to the P thirty eight, Charles Lindbergh. Yes, he ended up uh, he didn't actually fly in a cockpit with him. He was a passenger, and uh, he talked with Charles Lindbergh in in the back of the airplane. And they discussed uh, fuel management and, and you know, cruise control, if you want to call it cruise control. Um, just, just basically getting the best bang for your buck, you know, on your fuel, what, what you can do, the, the, the ins and outs of saving fuel and that sort of thing. And that's, that saved his bacon in, in one instance as well. Yeah. Yeah, why don't you just relate a little bit of that story? Yeah, sure. Um, he was coming back and... Uh, he was he was losing fuel. Everyone else had more fuel than he did, and uh, as he's approaching the field, uh, he's they're they're clearing like C, uh, not C one thirties, it's probably C forty sevens at the time. They're clearing cargo airplanes to to land in front of him and that sort of thing. And he is like skosh, and so he called the field. And he says, "I'm I'm coming in on the you know I'm coming in overhead. I'm going to turn and I'm going to land." And they're going to like wait a second, we got one more, and he's like, "Hey." If I don't put this thing on the, I'm gonna auger in here if I don't put this thing on the deck. And the the cargo aircraft commander came over the radio and went around. He said the power's coming up. Ralph said he saw the smoke come from the engines, the power was coming back in. They went around and he just then he went in and just landed basically right behind them and saved his butt, really. So and with yeah. very, very little fuel left on, on board. Yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, after the war was over, he um, was like uh, so many that were discharged. He didn't necessarily want to leave active duty, but in the end of the war, all the paperwork got messed up and he ended up being discharged and then joined the reserves. Yes, he came back in the reserves, flew P-51s in the reserves uh, with a couple of buddies of his, and uh, he loved that airplane as well. Um, as, as who wouldn't, who wouldn't love that airplane, you know? Um, but he, he knew that the F-86, the F-80s and the F-86s were coming online too down the road. So he, he was really looking forward to that. 
but he he enjoyed flying the uh, the P fifty one. Yep, and just a, a few years later, the Korean conflict uh, breaks out. He's already been recalled to uh, active duty, and this is this is where he really um, shows his medal as as being a, a combat fighter. Exactly. He uh, some of the things that he would, this is a great picture of him, by the way. I don't know. Uh, that's not enhanced or anything. That was just the way that I got it. Um, things that he would say about the the F eighty six was uh, that that would make me laugh was you know they didn't have missiles. Obviously, it was just nothing but guns coming out coming out of the nose of the aircraft. And he had a pipper, and he's just like you know some of the guys that 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 he flew with. You know, most of the guys had that down. Some of the guys they they would. They would squeeze the trigger before the pipper was over the airplane, that sort of thing. He goes, he goes I never had a problem with that. Because even through my training, I, he always he always got the awards for having the most holes in the drones. You know, the tow the tow drones, as he was going through training, it would, they'd be his his bullets, his shots that that would uh, that would riddle the, the drones. Same thing with the F eighty six. He'd say, you know, I just I just get in. In group, you're almost dancing with the guy in front of you. You know, you're just staying, you're anticipating his next move. You're leading him a little bit. When the pipper goes across his airplane, I, he, he, he would lean as well. His, his, uh, this was his forte as he's telling you the story. He'd say, when the pipper came across his airplane, I just kind of lean on the trigger and you know, just rape the guy. But it was, it was funny. Uh, yeah, he did. He did well there. He had uh, ten kills, double ace in Korea, uh, uh, and he flew with some great guys there too. You know, there's some, there's some guy. You know, some guys that really did well in Korea. Another good shot. And uh, see, go, go ahead. ahead. Yep. You can see stars gonna... from his kills back there on the on the nose of the aircraft. Uh, le our oh, left yeah. helmet there. Yeah. Yeah. Describe a little bit about his uh, time uh, in in country. What were his thoughts about Korea itself? Um, he liked Korea. Um, the the camaraderie was what the the, the squadron camaraderie was like second to none. And, and he always talked about that. He always talked about how how well the the guys got along. Even even. Uh, between squadrons and that sort of thing. They'd have their little, you know, like any other flying squadrons do, their little fun and games. But, um, you know, they were they were a well-oiled machine by the time that war was going on, you know, hot and heavy. Um, he just, the guy, was, he always set himself up to excel and never look back. He, he just excelled. <laughs> he was good. At anything that he flew, you know, and it's hard to, it's kind of cliche, but he really was. He was probably one of the best guys to fly each individual airplane that he flew, each each airframe, you know. Right. Something. He started out in the in the P eighties, P eighty fours before getting to the uh, uh, F eighty sixes. Um, Howard from England is uh, first of all, Howard, welcome. Uh, you staying up late or, or getting up early to, to see this? Um, it, he was wondering if the F eighty sixes had ejector seats. They, uh, they did. Okay. They did. Yeah, that's a good question. I wasn't sure myself. That was because that's right on the the, the sort of crossover yeah. time. No, and I'll let you say that. I'm 90% sure they did. How's that? And I've seen pictures. I'll, I'll have to go back through some of the pictures. I mean, that'll, that'll tell us for sure. But I remember, I think I remember seeing handles. Yeah. Okay. Um, with he, he did two tours in uh, Korea and actually came back to the States between his first and second uh, tour. What was, what was his assignment when he came back? When he came back to, uh, let's see, I got to think about this now. So that was... When he came back, in between tour, in between his Korean War tours, what did he do? What what year was that? Like uh, 51? fifty one? Uh, fifty two, I think. Is that when he came back to work on combat uh, uh, maneuvers? That's that's when he and Boots. Yes. Got he and Boots Bose got together. You're exactly right. And uh, 
what they did was they boots actually had a, had a mini book published it's a little pamphlet that they used and uh that they wrote and they would just go out those, those two guys were so good uh i actually talked to boots before those two guys passed away like october and december that far apart after october 31st i think boots passed away on on uh, halloween and then ralph passed away on on december 7th um you know they came back and they were working on the maneuvers and they would go out and fly against each other and they'd come back and they were trying to get other squadron mates to you know to carry them up the younger guys carry them under their wing and just you know try to help them out but what they they were working on you know if you had two f-86s very you know very similar um performance to go out there how do you gain an advantage over someone who is basically even keel with you and that's what that's what they worked on and he they ended up that's they came up with uh like the doctrine if you would if they had doctrine back in those days it was basically the fighter pilots doctrine that uh that they used and then he put that into uh, into practical terms on his second tour. Yes, and he went back over and he uh, he rolled. That's when he rolled inverted over the, the MIG and uh, came back. <laughs> he rolls inverted over the MIG. He comes comes back to the states again, and he's at Nellis and he's telling the story. And the Top Gun people were there. They were the film makers were there at the time when he was telling the story, and they heard him. And that's where they came up with the, the F-14 <laughs> over the top finger name, that, that sort of thing. So yeah, um, that, that, was, uh, that was born by Ralph. And of course, in that instance, uh, unlike the movie Top Gun, where, where they're uh, keeping up relations, uh, this was actually right. in the middle of a dogfight where he was right. overshooting his exactly. opponent and to try to, to bring himself yeah. back into a firing position, he All ended right. up inverted. <laughs> He's, he was he had every drag device out and uh, he's trying to bleed off as much energy as he could and that's how that's where he ended up and I have a picture I had him like in 2010 or 11 I had him pose I ordered a couple of uh, models I had him pose with that I think we have that coming up maybe possibly I'm not sure yes yep okay yeah yeah a little later on in the uh, in the slides yeah. here yeah. So that, yeah, that's a shot of his, uh, his aircraft. They were the MIG Maulers. That's kind of a neat little poster. It might be kind of hard hard to see, but you can see there's uh, triple aces up on top, double aces across that second row. There's Ralph on the far right over there. Yep. And uh, you can kind of, I mean, Jimmy Jabara, the names in there are like, holy smokes. There are some high rollers that we all know in that list. I really like that. I don't know who put that together. Back in the day, that might have been like in Stars and Stripes or something, you know. Uh, uh, we, yeah, we have uh, uh, Richard is asking uh, maybe, and this goes back to to uh, Boots and and Ralph working together. What was yep. probably the most innovative combat maneuver or formation that the uh, Air Force used to gain advantage over the MIGs? Um, man. You know, I, I couldn't really pinpoint it. I don't even know if he actually ever told me. Um, but there, they, there was a lot of, a lot of formation um, talk. Uh, I, I had a couple of diagrams in the book with, with their formations and that sort of thing. Um, I think a lot. It probably was the start of many formation techniques, jet jet techniques that you can use that you would use. Uh, with a much fast, faster aircraft, that sort of thing. Um, but I don't think he ever told me what what his what the best or the, his favorite was. Yeah, it's probably the combination of, uh, as you say, formation uh, formation work, which is now out our outgrowth of uh, World War II, but different with the in the jet era. Right. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, they flew a number of missions where uh, I think one of them. Uh, he thought they were up against uh, eight enemy aircraft. It turned out to be sixteen. Yes. Uh, that that had to be a uh, a busy day. Yeah, and he ended up. I think he had two kills in the in the damage the third, or even shot down the third. The, those guys. He was the the other guys. It, that 
particular mission, they talked about it as they stepped to the aircraft. And Lee was a, a very junior guy. And he turned to Ralph as they approached their airplanes and he said, hey, if you see something, you go ahead and take, you go ahead and take the bounce. I'll cover you. And it ends up, Ralph sees a little glint on the ground. And that, that's kind of, that's the impetus for the cover, actually, that sortie. Because he's at like 40,000 feet and he sees a glint on, on the deck and he calls it no one sees it so he rolls and then they just all start covering him so he's going straight down basically uh almost mock and uh he's got every drag device out he's got they've got they had boards on the side of the airplane that, that are depicted in that in the cover photo that are hanging out um you know he's idle he's going almost mock he starts pulling out and he ends up with pulling out wings level at like 300 feet and he's going the speed of heat. So he's trying to bleed off as much energy as he can. And that's when he's dancing around trying to, trying to bleed off that energy. And he ends up taking out lead who was a high time, uh, well-known uh, squadron commander from Korea or China. And uh, he takes him out, takes out the next guy. But the, the, the funny part of the story was there was another set of uh, F-86s up top, and it, they, they're, they, they, their version is there's Ralph in the in the phone booth, basically, you know, doing all of his stuff, and we're just sitting up here watching it, you know, watching it unfold, and he's just raking these guys. So yeah, but that that book cover, uh, that that shot is the, that's where he's rolled out wings level finally on the deck. And he, he really thought, he's like, well, either the wings are going to come off this thing or I'm going to pull out of it. I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. He had the stick in his, in his crotch, pulling as hard as he could, and it ended up working out for him. So, yeah. I just want to, uh, uh, you, were, you were correct about the ejector seats. Uh, Alan Hess did a little, a little bit of uh, research for us, and he confirmed it. That was, uh, it had uh, first-generation ejector seats. So. Yeah, if, if you, that last picture with the bar, with his first wife's name, Barb, was on that, that image. I, I was looking at that seat. That, that is the ejection seat right there. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. I've and, of course, to... yeah, the... Uh, the the picture on the on the bottom right there that's uh, the the uh, truce is signed for the uh, yeah. end of the the conflict but uh, he had a little bit of a controversial uh, uh, Very, shoot down shortly before that took place. So actually, the the truce was signed. Um, that's like the morning paper. The truce was signed and effective that morning, but or, or didn't go into effect until that night. They still had that day's sorties to fly, basically just cap missions and that sort of thing. He was tasked, his flight was tasked to fly north and uh, basically <clears throat> overfly airfields to see what aircraft were left on the field and that sort of thing. If anything came airborne, it was, you were cleared in hot and no questions asked, shoot him down. So he's up around the Yalu River and he, they're, they're checking out airfields. He's up around the Yalu River and here comes what looks like our version, C-47, a, a cargo aircraft, coming across the Yalu River in, into Korea. And he's like, what is that? What's going on here? So, um, and he, he had nine kills at this time. So he goes, he, he, he flies by it, and it's got a red star on the tail. And he's like, oh, and then, you know, he said, he goes, I'm heads down on my map. That is the Yalu River. I am on the south side. They are in our territory. They should not be here. You know, he's like, I'm double checking. I'm double checking. I was nervous. He goes, so I turned around, rolled in on him again, and gave him the gun and hit the right, I think they hit the right engine and gave him another one. And I think the right wing came off. And so they went down. Well, I've come to find out it had 19 Russian generals on board. They were flying out of China to Vladivostok. So he lands, uh, he's a double ace, but he said he went into like 56 hours of interrogation. Um, and I, by someone in the, our government, high, high ranking, uh, 56 hours of interrogation, trying to figure out, making sure that all of our, 
our I's were dotted and our T's were crossed to make sure nothing went wrong. And there, there's a uh, there's a a memorial in Vladivostok for that for the crew members that were on that. Uh, so yeah, and so that you know they were. I don't know if he walked every day feeling threatened, but you know especially in the first few years afterwards, at least he he, he was worried that that someone would come after him type thing as a revenge type deal. So you would, I mean, you would live in fear, I guess, not, you know, not knowing what, what's coming around the next corner type thing. Yeah, it was uh, interesting because the Soviets had said that they were in, uh, they were not in Korean airspace, they were in Soviet airspace and that, and so that became the controversy. And yes, and actually there's another, uh, and I can't remember the designation of the aircraft, but it was a U.S. Uh, reconnaissance airplane that was flying close to the Soviet Union shortly after this, um, and it ended up getting shot down. And the, in this case, the Soviets said, no, it was over our space, and right. the Americans said, no, it was international waters. So it was, some have speculated that's sort of a retaliation for right. the it's shoot down of the IL. Yeah. Crazy yes, relation. Their, their version was the IL-12 is what he shot down. So Korean War is, is over. He's he's a double ace back to the States. And uh, what does he do uh, for the next few years? So he comes back to the States then, and uh, he ends up, uh, he's at Randolph, and he's in like fighter assignments, I think. And when he ends up going, he goes over as, a, as an OG. He's an 06 at the time now. And uh, he, goes, he goes back over, he goes to Vietnam for the first time as an ops group commander. Uh, yeah, on his first go, and ends up, yeah, there's our big alley. Yeah, there's uh, F4 there. Yeah, so he's flying F4s over there. Um, he really, he really liked that. He really liked flying the F4, a gas hog, but, uh, he really enjoyed flying it. Um, he ends up on. He ends up to, for the Battle of Quezon. I think that was on his second tour, though. Actually, right. I'm trying to think. Yeah, of I, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the Battle of Quezon. Quezon was under siege. The Marines there were under siege, and this this was the this is how the book opens actually with this mission, and. The, the Marines had been under siege at Quezon for a long, long time, for months. And they were, the, the uh, Viet Cong were shooting down, you know, our, our C-130s um, or C-123s uh, yeah, C and C-130s, I think, at the time. Um, you know, they'd be on a short final and they, they were just racking them with, with artillery and, and machine gun fire. And they, we'd crash them on the runway and, you know, push them off the runway and open the runway back up and that sort of thing. Well, they had an emplacement that we could not get. And uh, Ralph ends up, um, he's got McManus in his back seat and they're up flying just a, a simple sortie. They're up, they're up flying a simple sortie and an L-19 bird dog uh, pilot just starts screaming over the radio. He needed help. We got these enemy emplacements and they are, you know, they're just killing us. And so Ralph was like, all right, you know, basically talk us in type, type thing. So they get down below some, some weather, they get down in there and uh, the L-19 talks him on the target. So he makes it, his first pass, I think was a dry pass and picked it up. And then he just set up a, a pattern and he had, he had four canisters and napalm and guns, and that was it. Uh, no bombs or anything. So he came through on a couple of passes, dropped his napalm, and the the bird dog pilot was just going nuts. He's like, oh, "That was a direct hit. That was that was great." They're still getting a little bit of fire from the surrounding enemy fire from the surrounding area. So he does a few more passes with nothing but guns, just coming across, you know, coming down the chute, and just firing in the area and ended up he killed that that gun emplacement and to, you know silenced it and uh, over the years there have been many people that thought that deserved the medal of honor um 
this never come to fruition. Uh, but um, that I think that sortie was probably his uh, greatest sortie and his the one he liked to tell the most. Uh, that was something else. Yeah. And I tried to I tried to write it with his excitement as best I could, um, because you, you, your heart will get thumping if you if you if you can really get into it. Your heart will get thumping, you know, as he's getting walked on the target and uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, it, in part of your description of what Ralph had said, he said he could actually see the the bullets coming toward the cockpit. He was, yes. As as he was going in he could see them coming back out yes they landed after that sortie they had 23 holes in the side of in the fuselage of the f4 and some of them were through and throughs you know and in the wings and that sort of so they were taking some massive heat and but that thing you know that f4 was a dump truck man that thing could take and uh he, you know like i said that was probably his favorite story to tell and um, I included the citation for that in the, in the as an appendix, just to kind of just to lend credence to the stories that he told. I tried to include the citations just so that you know you can see you get his version and the way that I told his version as I wrote it in the book. But then you get proof of what the how the Air Force felt about it in the, in the actual citation for that for that mission. So um, I hope that paints a better picture. For the reader yes um, and one of the one of the, the things that i think made it successful was that he changed his uh, approach to that target on every one of the passes so the enemy was never sure where they were coming from next exactly exactly he, he told me uh on one pass that as they went by he looked out the side of the aircraft and they they had uh the, i think there were zsu 23s gun the the, the four guns and you, 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 I think there's a pedal system and also a hand where you're to spin the gun, to turn the gun. And he saw the guy's face as, as he went by on one of his, they, they were on the deck and, you know, 400 knots or something. And he looked out the side of the airplane as they went by trying to figure out where these guys were actually, you know, in, where they were in place or dug in. And uh, he saw that. So, um, yeah, he asked. He told me McManus after they went on their first pass, uh, and I talked to McManus. He he's has since passed as well, but I called McManus in Florida to get his version of the story. And uh, Ralph said, after after the first pass, he goes, "Well, are you are you ready for this?" He goes, "Well, um, they're sh they're shooting at us. I think we were hit after the, like the first pass." And right, he goes, "They're shooting at us," and Ralph goes. <laughs> Something like, yeah, I know. He goes, are you, are you going to be all right back there? He, goes, he said, just don't touch anything unless I need you to take the aircraft. He goes, I've got it. He's like, he's like, okay. Well, how do you feel about it? I don't know. And and, and Ralph was like, I don't know either because I've never been hit. I've I've never been hit like the you know type thing. So it it was uh, it was quite a sortie. And, and McManus, uh, also, McManus had nothing but he was actually a, a pilot, a gib. A guy in back that he was actually a pilot, not a Wizzo, flying the Ralph's back seat that day. Um, and he that McManus had nothing but the utmost respect for Ralph. He's like, that guy was he was a wizard with a stick and rudder. He he was a wizard. So it was really interesting to talk to him. Yeah. And uh amazingly, they both, either even though they didn't say anything during the during the the actual combat, they were both concerned because, as you said earlier, the F-4 was a gas guzzler, and they were getting really close to, to needing to find a tanker or get on the ground pretty quick. But at the same time, Ralph didn't want to break off until he had as done as much damage as he could. And the, the fact that the two of them had that same thought in their minds but didn't say anything about yeah, it. Well, they yeah, just wasn't the the awareness. Yeah. And, and so did the, the forward air controller. He knew they were getting low, too. Exactly. Yeah, and then the uh, forward air controller, his uh, ground bosses were like, get that guy out of there. We're, we're knocking it off right now. And Ralph just made another another pattern and came back in a different aspect and did it again, you know. He's like, no, we're, we're going to go, we'll 
we'll go bingo fuel bingo munitions before I leave this place. We're going to shut this place down for sure. It is definitely one of the more uh, gripping uh, parts of the book, uh, and I enjoyed it uh, thoroughly because we can only do so much justice to it as we're talking about it. It's right. it's reading it and 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 absorbing everything that's happening that uh, that really brings it to life. Right, and the the way that I the way that I approached the book was that story was so much of his Air Force career as being the biggest the, the best biggest and best best sortie, I think, and he thought as well. Um, I mean, if you lead off with that, there, the only thing the book can do is trickle down, you know, it, you can't top that story, right? So what I did is I ended up, I, break, I broke that story up and I'm not giving it away anything in the book for people who want to purchase it. Um, but I basically took it through just past the halfway point and that's when Ralph said, I know I can see it, the, the AAA coming at him. And then I pick it up. At, I tell the rest of the story. Then I pick it up at the end, and basically a reattack version, um, to to wrap that portion up. And it would just it's just kind of a, a good way to sandwich that sortie with his entire career uh, sandwiched in between the the front and back end of that sortie. Well, Vietnam uh, is uh, in full swing. The nineteen sixty nine comes along, and he gets married. He, uh, he gets married. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret just passed away. Margaret yeah, just oh, passed away okay. uh, about a month ago or so. I don't know the actual date, but yeah, she just passed away about a month ago. Yeah, yeah. we're married on uh, Veterans Day, nineteen sixty nine. Yeah, yeah. Rhett, they met at the auger at the auger in the basement at the Par O Club now, and uh, when he, he he laid his eyes on her, he said, "My God, she's a cute muffin." And they had a mutual friend. Another flyer knew her. She was uh, Margaret was a nurse, and introduced the two of them. And the sparks lit. And they, he was a, he was an 06. He was divorced 06, and they got married. And uh, he took her two kids or her three kids under his belt and under his wing. And uh, those those three kids love him, and he loved them. Let me tell you, he really did. Well, his career wasn't quite over uh, after Vietnam. Uh, he, you talked about him uh, after the Korean conflict, uh, sort of living in fear a little bit of, of what might happen. He gets assigned to Iran yes. in the days before everything was happening there, but that was not a safe place to be either. No, they, uh, they, Margaret really lived in fear and uh, they were, he was driven everywhere that he would, he would travel. He was driven, had a driver. And they, they got, had some issues on the road a couple of times with uh, people trying to take them out. It ends up, um, his exec, I don't know if it was his exec or the next guy's exec, was killed on the sidewalk out in front of his house right after they PCSed out of there, was, was shot in the back of the head. By, I don't know if it was a sniper or a guy on the street or something like that. So. Yes, they lived in fear, and it was legit. They, they should have been living in fear. And that was that was one aspect of uh, recent history that that I was not aware of. Is as far as um, you described some of the, the social uh, social economic things that are, were happening in Iran at the time, some of the stresses that were going on, and uh, to just um, having gone through the uh, Iran hostage crisis right. from this vantage point, from being in the right. states, it just seemed like it blew up. Uh, almost overnight, but this was really oh. something that was brewing for quite a while. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. That's a good take. There we go. There's the uh, uh, F-86 wow. shot. <laughs> yeah, I showed up with those. Those are two little metal airplanes. I think I just got them off Amazon or something. I said, hey, well, I want to take some some photos of you. And he's like, all right. I said, you got your leather jacket? Yeah. So we just stepped out in front of the assisted living home there and I said, show me your aspect over the top of that MiG that day. And he's like, well, we were kind of like this about right, right about there. I, I was a little bit behind him in the cockpit. I could look right down in, inside his cockpit. And so I said, you just look at the airplanes. I'll take a couple of shots of you. So this is one of them. He, he liked that. He had fun that day. Oh, and Here here's he the uh, unveiling that's, of the uh, O Club. Yes, that's uh, General. It was 06 at the time. But now um, Lieutenant General Jackie Van Ovos on the left there. She was the commander at the. At Randolph at the time, she's uh, 
introducing it as the new park club. That's Margaret right behind him there. And uh, Jackie Vio there on the left. There he is, same day when I took the, the MIG, the airplane shot, the model shots. I said, I'm just gonna have you hold up a couple of aces. You were a double ace, we got a flag here. And uh, he liked that shot too. That's, he was still active duty, I think. Maybe just retired there. Quite a lot of uh, uh, citations on that on that uniform. 60 different citations, everything from the uh, Air Force Cross and the Distinguished Flying Cross, the only person to have earned both of those. Exactly. Uh, and many, many other uh, awards, uh, which most of those you've chronicled in the book as well. Yes, yep. yes. And, and uh, most of, I think, all of them, I think, are the citations are, are in the book, in the appendix as well. Yeah. yeah. An amazing career. And uh, he's also a part of the uh, CAF's American Combat Airmen Hall of Fame, uh, inducted in uh, 2001. Oh. Uh, so we're happy to have him there as well. That's awesome, yeah. If someone's interested in the book, uh, how, can they, how can they get a copy of the book? It's out there on Amazon. It's, it's basically anywhere books are sold. You can get it at Target, Walmart, uh, uh, Amazon's a biggie. Just, just, you can just search on par. Just make yep. sure that if you're looking on eBay or something, this is the second edition. So the second edition has got white type here for the title. The okay. first edition was blue type. And so there are some out there on eBay. Don't buy it. Don't buy the first edition because this has got the forward by General Goldfein. And it also includes the photo section. That's what we added for the second edition. Yeah. And you get more, more book. For more book. Okay. Uh, yes, you have uh, some pretty powerful uh, uh, endorsements uh, written there, General Goldfein being being one of them. Yes. Um, and uh, what's, uh, how did you uh, convince him to do that? No, there was no convincing. <laughs> he was getting ready to retire. And uh, I had met him on two separate occasions at Randolph. And um, I just, I emailed him. And I, I got his email through the, his exec. And uh, I just said, hey, here's who I am. I've met you a couple of times at Randolph. Uh, we both know Ralph. I've got a second edition coming out and a, uh, a forward written by you um, would really, you know, that, that would be the, the cat's meow if we get you to write to write the forward. I, I'll write something suggested and let your team and, and you change it as you see fit. And he wrote me, I wrote him like on a Sunday afternoon and at nine o'clock Monday morning an email from him, I gets re his reply. He wow. came back and says, you bet. <laughs> I CC I CC three people that I want involved. He said, uh, "Yep, send us what you got, and uh, we'll get back to you." And so he did. Very nice of him. Great, yes. great. Well, in the we've still got a few minutes left. We're going to run through some of the uh, the photos that you've taken through the years, yep. uh, okay. including this uh, the uh, do little Raider B twenty five. That's yep. a that was, that was a fun day. real fun day over San Antonio. We flew out of Stinson. I was in another B twenty five. Uh, we're just flying formation around the tower there and I just slowed the shutter speed down to get the prop order and I happened to get the sun reflection right off the props there. But that's what I like as a photographer. So uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was my favorite shot that day. Basically the same type thing there. The prop were. Again, and not, Mitchell. Yeah. Not the, not the best day to shoot, not the best weather to shoot in, but it was fine. It was fine. Yeah. As we're uh, as we're looking at some of these pictures, I just see an, another question popped in. Um, did Ralph have any opinions on the period films, such as like the John Wayne fighter pilot about F-86s in Korea, or uh, Jimmy Stewart's Strategic Air Command? Do you have any thoughts on any of those that he shared? He never mentioned either, uh, ever to me. Um, so I don't I don't know, honestly. Uh, here's an AWACS over Alaska. He just came off the boom and was, was dropping away. And I was like, I kind of like that background. I was, I'd run to the back of the tanker. We had another guy in the seat. So I ran back to the back and said, I'll just see what I can get back there. B1 over flat, the flat Midwest, probably Nebraska. <laughs> Got to fly a Tudor up in Canada. That, that, and that, Photo right there was a cover of Torch on of Torch magazine for one month. 
Uh, I was in the other tutor and that was fun. That was a fun day. We're just out doing G warm up maneuvers right here, right here. Just basically Shondells and stuff like that, the two aircraft. And we ended up, we ended up not 90 degrees to the ground, but in an awkward formation. I saw that street corner down there, the, the trees in the, in the bottom with it. So it just wasn't a green field background. I was like, yeah, I'll hit that. So I took it and that was one of my favorite shots that day. How has your uh, photography changed uh, through the years as far as going oh, from I, film to digital? Yeah, I I shot so much Tri-X pan film when I was young, you know, when I was 10 to 15 years old, that was 50 years ago. I, I was shooting Tri-X pan film. A lot of my aviation stuff that I shot in the tanker, I would shoot Kodachrome slide film. And what you're seeing are uh, uh, tips, they are, uh, um, scans scans from scans of slides because I, I i needed to get those digitally because if my house burned down and i lose all those slides i don't have record of anything so i got them all it took me about three months 24 hours a day scanning like six slides at a time but i finally got them all a lot of these are you can tell it, that's an old image that's that's probably from the late 80s uh old old image that was Kodachrome scan, so you can tell it's it's very very contrasty. I just kind of like the lake run, the river running by back there. EF one eleven, you don't see very many of those. That was uh, Desert Storm, an Aviano F sixteen. That that one was during Allied Force. Shaw, that was Allied Force. They've got the harms there. And then some night Oshkosh. Oh, I love that night. I try to shoot that every year. I just get out there and I just, uh, I'll shoot, put my camera on. You can see a guy in that one on the far right. He's, he's shooting the time of exposure too. Right? It was dark, so I didn't even know he was over there. So I'm just trying to get some some lights going on behind them and that sort of thing. But you talked about how things have changed. Uh, I switched from film to digital in 06. And I just got my first mirrorless camera in January. So I switched to mirrorless now. Oh, OK. And they don't get any cheaper, Steve, at all. <laughs> Believe me. Nope. Oh, that's a gorgeous shot. Yeah, that was, that was a fun night. Really good night there. Yeah. So any, uh, I think we've got all our questions wrapped up tonight. Any final thoughts before we uh, sign off? Uh, no, I just, I really appreciate you guys taking the time and, and inviting me to come on. Um, hi to everyone out there. I'm going to, I'll be up at Oshkosh this year. Um, if I can get, uh, I'll try to get with, uh, with the gals at the book signings and see if I can't get oh, some sure. time and sign on par. If I, if I can, and it gets in the newspaper, you see my name or something, you guys in the commemorative of course, stop on by. And uh, whether you buy a book or not, I don't care. We'll just shoot the crap. Sounds good. We'll yeah. uh, we'll be looking we're looking for you out on the flight line this year uh, uh, at Oshkosh. That sounds great. I really appreciate the time, Steve. Had a great time. Good. Well, thank you, Ken. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Again, don't forget to uh, click that like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about any of our uh, future shows. As always, if you have an idea for a topic that you'd like to hear more about, uh, whether it's an airplane or a person, maybe some stories uh, from the war, just let us know. Uh, just drop Leah Block a note at media at cafhq.org. Again, thanks to uh, Ken Murray for uh, being our guest this evening. Uh, go read the book. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great read, and you'll get a, a new appreciation for one of America's finest uh, combat pilots, Ralph Parr. Until the if next you, time. If you, if, you it, you go ahead. if you read it, review it. Review it on Amazon, review it on goodreads.com, and we'll be good. Sounds good. Thanks again, Ken. And uh, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night. Thank you.